Okay, so are you ready to go? I am. Uh, thank you for your patience with the technical issues. I have no idea what was going on. Thanks for figuring it out. <laughs> All right. Hmm. Since the early days of the pandemic, researchers, care providers, and others have expressed our concerns about what COVID and the social and political responses to the pandemic would mean for queer and trans people. This is a difficult and important question. The vulnerability of queer and trans people was not a political or institutional priority before the pandemic, and it hasn't been a priority during the pandemic either. Even as queer scholars and health researchers, noting the parallels between the COVID-19 pandemic and the AIDS crisis. Here's one tension that queer people deal with. On the one hand, home, social distancing, and isolation have been primary public health and government strategies for dealing with COVID. On the other hand, queer community, queer sexuality, and queer freedom regularly push beyond the boundaries of home and thus seem at odds with risk management and social distancing. People have been required to sacrifice crucial elements of our lives in order to manage our own and others' risk of infection. People have set aside friendships, hobbies, social gatherings, extended family interactions, rites of passage, such as bar and bat mitzvahs and school graduations, human contact outside the home, and dating and having sex outside of monogamous partnerships. These sacrifices are true of all people, but it may have special consequences for queer people. In public health orders, home and the implied nuclear family unit living within that home are a particular set of assumed ideals that researchers describe as heteronormative. They're straight, white, monogamous, joyful and competent parenting, safe, well, and uncomplicated. These are the ideals that are implied. This heteronormative home was always complicated with taken for granted untruths. The assumptions that everyone has a home, that homes have enough space and resources within them to meet our needs, that homes are filled with the people most important to us, and that homes are safer than what lies beyond the front door. Many people, particularly queer people, do not find support in our families of origin. Many of us build relationships that stretch beyond the usual bounds of home polyamorous relationships, fictive kinships, and made families. The requirement to pause or abandon these fundamental sources of support means that once again, queer people face pressure to negate critical aspects of themselves and their community in order to ensure health and security. In this presentation, we'll discuss the ways that queer people have grappled with the requirement to stay at home the impact of public health policies that foreground home, the ways that those policies shape queer relationships with ourselves and with others. Our analysis draws on a study of queer people's experiences of COVID in the greater Toronto area conducted in the spring of 2021 as the world struggled to live with the COVID pandemic and restrictive public health responses. We conducted a survey and Zoom interviews, and today we'll focus on the interviews. Our team conducted the interviews from May 2nd to June 17th, 2021. As we'll remember, this is a particular moment in the long stretch of the last two and a half years. Toronto was at the tail end of its third wave of COVID infections. New cases still topped 1,000 on some days, but they'd been steadily dropping since mid-April. Ontario was in phase two of vaccine rollouts. Phase one, which catered to high-risk populations, ran from December 2020 to March 2021. Phase two extended vaccine eligibility to, for example, those living in hotspots, and 53 of the province's 114 hotspots were in Toronto, to designated essential workers, adults aged 55 and older, and essential caregivers and healthcare workers. On the day of the project's first interviews, just over 1 million people had received their first dose, and about 95,000 people had received their second dose of the COVID-19 vaccine in Toronto, a city of nearly 3 million. By the last day of our interviews, over 2 million people had received their first dose, and nearly 75, uh, 
750,000 people had received their second. As vaccines rolled out, Toronto continued to contend with stay-at-home orders. When our interviews began, Ontario was in its third emergency and stay-at-home order, in place since April 8, 2021. This order required those not considered essential workers to remain at home except for grocery shopping or pharmacy visits. It allowed them to get essential health care, exercise outdoors, or do paid work that was impossible remotely. Non-essential retail was restricted to curbside pickup or delivery. Schools and childcare remained open. That order expired on June 2nd of 2021, but restrictions remained in place until mid-June when due to decreasing ICU rates, decreasing case rates, and a 72% first dose vaccine rate for those 18 and older, Ontario entered step one of its three-step reopening plan. The months in which we conducted these interviews were marked by a careful, cautious hope that vaccination and social distancing would pay off in widespread immunity and a reduction or even elimination of COVID cases. So in the midst of this hope and throughout our interviews, we heard queer people assert that home, the space that Torontonians were meant to find refuge in from COVID, couldn't be taken for granted as a space of safety and care. For some people, staying at home meant living with family members who dismissed their fundamental sense of self. The first quote is from Era, so if you can go back one slide, Sarah. Era, who's a 19-year-old non-binary trans femme participant, explained in her interview, they say they support me, but they really don't because as a trans person, they don't respect my chosen name or preferred name, pronouns, et cetera, <clears throat> et cetera. I'd, get, I'd say, I guess, the best way I could describe their attitude towards me is like tolerant. For ERA and for us, chosen names and pronouns are ways to assert a self with the support of people who will respect that assertion, nurture the self and allow for the new possibility. A family's refusal to use chosen names and pronouns or their simple tolerance of those names and pronouns suggests that they may be refusing to give someone the respect that they deserve and denying them nurturance at home where ERA, <clears throat> excuse me, and others are meant to be safe. For others we interviewed, staying at home meant losing access to queer affirming mental health care and to the self that such care supported. Gayatri, who was 26 years old, South Asian, queer, and exploring their gender and sexuality, stated in their interview that during the COVID stay-at-home orders, a lot of depressive ex episodes have lasted longer than they normally would. I felt very dysphoric at times. I also identified as like bisexual and queer before the pandemic, and I guess I was just beginning to explore my gender identity when the pandemic began or prior to it just beginning. Recently, I've started exploring it more, and that's when those feelings of dysphoria started to settle in. I haven't really been able to take much care of my mental health during the pandemic, aside from attempting to access walk-in programs and being on the wait list for counseling. I've just been kind of been very overwhelmed most of the time. Still others found themselves stuck at home, living with hostile ex-lovers, unable either to extricate themselves from the relationship or to find peace within it. When an interviewer asked about their living situation, Rafael, who is 40 years old, gender fluid, gay, and from Mexico, described it as complicated. The space is so tiny, and I feel it more now. I live with my ex-partner, so we are all the time like trying to avoid each other. But in this, we live in a two-bedroom apartment, so we don't share the bedroom, but we have common spaces, and it has been difficult. I let him win most of the time, but sometimes he says, Raphael, don't walk in front of me. Raphael, you're blocking the TV. Raphael, you're making too much noise in the kitchen. Raphael, you are interrupting me. You're annoying. So it's very stressful. Part of that is causing me depression and I'm afraid to leave my room. No joke, I've been a week without leaving my room except to go to the bathroom. And I bring food to my room by being like this, like afraid to go out. Raphael, a racialized newcomer to Canada, explained that the provincial government had slowed its processing of applications for legal separations during the pandemic, leaving them stuck and afraid inside their home. 
Raphael laughed bitterly as they asserted, like, I'm afraid to go out to the streets, but I'm afraid sometimes even to go out to the space I share. For Raphael, the safety that they got from contracting COVID meant sacrificing other forms of safety and thus opening themselves up to other forms of harm and danger. During the pandemic, home became too small to be safe when families would not recognize queer people's gendered selves, when they could not seek care for the selves they yearned to be, and when they lived in fear in the rubble of romantic, ruined romantic relationships and without the social support necessary to remove themselves safely from a home marked by abuse. Escaping danger became a balancing of risks, often undertaken without the support of therapy, contact with friends and other community members, or municipal services that might have been available before the pandemic. The cultural critic Rebecca Solnit has written about the importance of having access to a world outside the home. Solnit writes, the shell of home is a prison of sorts, as much as a protection, a casing of familiarity and continuity that can vanish outside. Walking the streets can be a form of social engagement, even of political action when we walk in concert, as we do in uprisings, demonstrations, and revolutions. But it can also be a means of inducing reverie, subjectivity, and imagination, a sort of duet between the prompts and interrupts of the outer world and the flow of images and desires and fears within. At times, thinking is an outdoor activity and a physical one. For Solnit, wandering allows us to engage with other people and to unleash imaginative possibilities. People need room to roam and to get lost. Quote, not literally lost, as in not knowing how to find your way, but lost as in open to the unknown, and the way that physical space can provide psychic space. Such roaming is impossible under the conditions of stay-at-home orders, and it is also crucial to what Solnit describes as, quote, imagining yourself in another place as another person, end quote. Over and over, our participants consistently describe the consequences of losing access to the city in which they had made a home, built community, and found themselves. They worried that the personal and community safety they were supposed to seek through social distancing and staying at home would put those same communities in danger. Even as many participants, particularly those who identify as women, femmes, or trans, emphasize that Toronto's gay village is not a queer space that welcomes everyone, or indeed had even welcomed the speaker in the past, they still expressed fear that queer spaces and businesses in the village would not be able to survive the extended absence of customers. Miguel, a 21-year-old gay Latinx man, explained, those places are more than just like the Google Maps identifier of like bar, like they mean so much more to us. Like I remember the weekend before the pandemic was declared a pandemic. I was at a queer bar in Toronto and there's a great picture of a friend of mine and me there dancing. And like every couple of months, me and my friends send each other that picture. I'm just like, remember like the last great night we had before the world went to shit? And like, that's what that means. Like, it's not just like a bar, like it wasn't. The gay village and its queer spaces offer Miguel much more than a bar or a bookstore. Despite their imperfections, they were and are precious spaces, and memories and photographs helped to locate Miguel not only within those spaces, but also in a world that made room for them. Raphael, who, as described above, lived in a hostile environment with their ex-partner, echoed these fears. Raphael predicted that a queer bar in Toronto is probably going to be gone once this is finished. And it's a very important place because a lot of people like rely on that place to feel safe. To go to the drag shows, it's, it is actually one of the few places that are very inclusive with everyone. And it should be very important to keep a place like that because it doesn't matter if you arrive wearing a dress or being very manly. The concept of man is relative. Everyone is welcome there. Participants acknowledge that Toronto's village is imperfect, even as they describe their fears that these spaces, increasingly rainbow-washed, white, and gentrifying, might not be waiting for them on the other side of the pandemic. 
For many of our participants, the lives they had expected to live were disrupted, frozen, shifted, or skipped over during the COVID pandemic. Participants described what they would have or could have done had the pandemic not stymied them. Ravi, a 59-year-old cisgender gay South Asian man, retired in December of 2019. A vivacious extrovert, he threw himself into his retirement, packing his new schedule with classes, queer group outings, the arts, and time with friends and family, ensuring that nearly every moment of his days were filled with things that brought him joy. When the pandemic hit just a few months later, he felt as though everything he'd looked forward to for so long was taken away, just when he finally had the time to enjoy it. As Ravi explained, I had experienced total happiness between December of 2019 to March 2020. I had everything. I had the time to enjoy it all, and that was part of the problem. That's why I went into such a funk depression, because I'd had complete happiness for three months, you know, and then it all got cruelly and horribly taken away from me suddenly. If not for the pandemic, Ravi is sure he would have had what he had defined as total happiness, the ability to live his ideal life. He mourned the version of himself he had only briefly gotten to inhabit, grieving for the life he would have had. Other participants described tensions between what they considered their true selves and the selves they became during social distancing and as they honored stay at home orders. Such tensions were uncomfortable, even if the new selves did not necessarily generate unhappiness. Polymor uh, polyamorous participants, for example, described falling into monogamy almost accidentally as a result of stay at home orders and the difficulty of maintaining a bubble within the polyamorous relationships that one participant described as inevitably a web rather than a closed circle. Anthony, a gay white man in his late twenties described his situation as follows. I ended up meeting someone new as well, actually. So I ended up entering into a relationship with my, this boyfriend. And so we've been together since the beginning of August, unlike my previous relationship. And I think as a result of the pandemic, as well as his personal preference, the relationship was monogamous and continues to be monogamous. My previous relationships, and my, my own philosophy on relationships is that I don't really think monogamy is like super great, but because of, you know, of the pandemic and, you know, sort of how that's how it, how it's working and it's so far so good on that front. And so, yeah, so we're still together. And so that's been great too. In a new relationship faced with a partner's desire for monogamy and a pandemic that limits his social world, Anthony revises his sense of his next self. He now entertains the possibility of monogamy, monogamy, even if he does not consider it super great. As Anthony concludes his account of the self emerging in this monogamous relationship, his sentences almost seem to crumble as he utters them, concluding that, well, they are still together and thus the monogamous relationship has been great. As Anthony describes his new monogamous self, he seems also to defend against another looming self. The alternative to this monogamous self, a self that's alone. For some queers, the call to stay at home may have meant not only vulnerability to the cruelty of private life and biological family, but also relief from the everyday violence of public life, including racialized and colonial violence against black, brown, and indigenous selves, particularly low income trans women and femmes of color. In Toronto, where in 2022, the Toronto Police Service released data um, proving a long suspected institutional pattern of extreme targeting of black, indigenous and brown residents, where the police declined to investigate the murders of queer men committed by serial killer Bruce MacArthur for decades, and where the city has waged a profoundly violent and expensive war on unhoused people throughout the pandemic. Queer freedom to roam joyfully persistently depends on one's proximity to whiteness, to wealth, and to the market for consumer goods. Some participants found that in withdrawing from public spaces, they were able to carefully cultivate the contact they had with others, limiting their exposure to racism, transphobia, and homophobia, 
while deepening their connections to communities that honored their identities. While the pandemic seemed to pose a barrier to many people's next selves, for some participants, the social isolation and shift to online social communities seems to have created the conditions of possibility to roam internally, meandering and exploring the parts of themselves that were generally inaccessible due to the foregrounded distractions of pre-pandemic life. As Vaughn, a 21-year-old lesbian Filipino-Canadian who newly was identifying as non-binary explained, they, them, those pronouns, that probably started like four months ago, back when I really had time to like go there. And in general, to think about what that even means to me. So definitely being alone and like just having time to think to myself with a full head of sleep. But, you know, I guess being isolated has really made me reevaluate what gender means to me and what pronouns feel comfortable. So here, not roaming outside the home allowed opportunities for Vaughn to roam in other ways, to experiment and to embody the gender presentations that felt right for them. They continued in the interview, yeah, mainly the they, them, and also the, I feel like dress is also a big part and that like there are a lot of things that I want to wear but I also don't wanna wear them outside because I don't wanna feel comfortable, uncomfortable or be yelled at. So like when I'm just dressing up at home or I'm just dressing up for a walk outside my home, I feel comfortable doing that. So yeah, I'm comfortable in the sense of like, I have the people that I talk to or my bubble and that they respect the pronouns that I like. And obviously I feel comfortable being queer around them. And then also I can dress however I want because it's like, feel safe to do that now. Home offered Vaughn a different kind of freedom to roam among their thoughts through a range of possibilities for dress and self-presentation with a select audience and the safety to do so without encountering violence. This space of queer possibility was shared by other participants who experienced themselves in a new light and witnessed others considering new gender and sexual selves. As Rahul, a gay Latin American immigrant in his late twenties similarly explained, I've been seeing a lot of my queer friends just become more queer and more gay. And just everyone's been opening up a lot more about their sexualities and their gender identities, which is such a great conversation. And they really inspired me to start looking at how I look at myself. Raul explained that he attributed the gender and sexual shifts, not to the trauma of being queer, but rather to a sense that this is cool, let's explore this, let's have fun, let's take our time. This sense of possibility and dynamism fosters thinking that recalls a sense of queerness, transgression and play in what seems to belong to the before COVID times. For some people, COVID has afforded time for chilling and thinking, and that time has allowed for an exploration of a next gender and sexual self perhaps a boy, perhaps non-binary, perhaps gay, perhaps queer. Counterintuitively, the lack of freedom to roam in the physical world created more freedom to roam internally and within the protection of a more cultivated, bounded digital queer community. Access to these kinds of spaces is not universal. Among our participants, it was generally more likely for younger queer folks to both be able to find digital queer communities and to feel comfortable and fulfilled in engaging with them. For many older, particularly gay participants, digital spaces were a pale imitation of the streets, bathhouses, queer bookstores, and gay bars they used to roam with friends and lovers. Furthermore, having the space and time for introspection, reading, and intentional social interaction is very much mediated by class and life stage, as is the ability to stay home at all. We heard many examples of queer resilience in our interviews. Some people describe being able to carve out a space for their next selves or finding ways to sustain their current selves. They also described grief and the many compromises they had made. Even those who could reel off a list of their virtual activities and social engagements describe themselves simply as being okay enough or finding some partial escape from the traumatic present is not the queer vision. For these folks, their sense of the future was limited. 
Know me, a 39-year-old white, pansexual, and bisexual person who used either she or they pronouns, described a narrowing horizon of possibility for herself since the pandemic. I'm going to be unraveling what happened this year for a while. I went into this, obviously it was a hell of a shock, but I went into this in a really good place and kind of with an unofficial goal to not leave this pandemic, you know, more traumatized than I found it. That's not, I did not win this goal because legitimately there are some ways my future has shrunk from this. I walked into this thinking that I probably would be able to have a child and I don't know that's gonna happen. And I got an autoimmune diagnosis in between those things. There's a lot of things that are not gonna happen anymore. And pulling apart all that from everything else, from the kind of severe disappointment of there was a chance to do the better thing as a society. And it doesn't look like it's been taken. I feel like, yeah, the future is constricted and that has done a number on me, you know, emotionally speaking. For Nomi, the pandemic made several desired versions of her next self seem impossible. Herself as a parent, a healthy person, a person with much to look forward to. Instead, as she describes, her future has shrunk, even as she had managed to be okay enough in the present. Clearly, the ability to roam, to seek our next selves, and to create spaces of queer possibility over these last couple of years has been shaped by the call to stay home. For cisgender heterosexual people, Home may not be a problem. It's the site of familial relationships, roles, and identities that give shape to the present and future. Being a daughter, a wife, a mother, a grandmother. And public health policy has largely respected these roles by emphasizing the home as the site of safety. For many of the queer people we spoke to, home has not been a refuge. Instead, this space has made it difficult to embody their most desirable presence and futures. The freedom to roam, to find a space for, as Solnit puts it, reverie, subjectivity, and imagination, is essential to the pursuit of self and the queer drive to create otherwise worlds of possibility. What's been lost is the freedom to roam, to live free of people who refuse to respect the selves we're trying to become and to find love and support beyond our families. What is the freedom to roam if not a means of dreaming otherwise and creating otherwise? Ashan Crawley, writing poignantly about white supremacy and anti-Black violence in the United States, explains, to begin with the otherwise as a word, a concept, is to presume that whatever we have is not all that it is possible. Otherwise, it is a concept of internal difference, internal multiplicity. The otherwise is the disbelief in what is current and a movement towards and an affirmation of imagining other modes of social organization, other ways for us to be with each other. Otherwise as plentitude. Otherwise is the enunciation and concept of irreducible possibility irreducible capacity to create change, to be something else, to explore, to imagine, to live fully, freely, vibrantly. Otherwise Ferguson, otherwise Gaza, otherwise Detroit, otherwise worlds. Otherwise expresses an unrest and discontent, a seeking to conceive dreams that allow us to wake laughing, tears of joy in our eyes, dreams that have us saying, I hope this comes true. Roaming is not merely an escape from the social world that binds and represses us, but a path to create new selves and new social worlds. If we are to become queerer and gayer and freer, if we are to be able to look at our next selves and say not only, I hope this comes true, but I know this comes true, those that we love will use our pronouns, that our institutions will stand for our difference and our right to exist and our joy, that we will live free of harassment and state violence, that our lives will exceed our homes, then we must commit to these ruptures, these new normals, and roam within these unfamiliar paths with all of the determination of queers of generations past, 
who made the world otherwise in the aftermath of the AIDS crisis and dreamed beauty and life and community into being. Thank you. And now we'd like to return uh, just briefly to the poll that you participated in at the beginning um, as an opening to discussion. So I think now um, people see my screen. Yeah, okay. And if I ask, we'll start to see the responses that are from people. Um, and if you haven't responded yet, you can see at the top of the screen. If you'd like to, you can enter menti.com and use this code. And just use this as a chance for us to get a sense of who's in the room. I, I took uh, some time to participate and I expect that Sarah has as well and everyone's welcome to. So you can see a lot of the feelings that we heard in the interviews also appearing here. So some sense of relief, but also sense of isolation, restlessness, some sense that things are stifling, some fear, right? Paranoia, some really difficult feelings, anxiety dissociation, the term prison, which we heard in one of the quotations that we shared. Also some more hopeful things around discovery. And it could be that the same person wrote discovery that wrote fear, right? That these things actually coexist. Um, we often have difficult feelings alongside our um, uh, more pleasant feelings. So thanks to everyone who participated to help us get a sense of who's in the room. I might just leave that up for another couple of minutes while we get started on the questions. But I think at this point we wanna open it up for discussion. I think we have about 15 minutes, is that right? 